This is the story of the reproduction of the last item for the Cabinet of Curiosities, the bottles. When I started this project some 20 years ago now, I knew that I wanted to do it all. The box, the finishing materials, the thread, and everything down to the little inkwells and bottles that were found in most boxes. Those pieces were what I called the jewelry. You could just have the dress, but you really needed all of the fancy bits. It is the bottles that solidify the idea that these embroidered boxes were all-in-one boxes for personal items for a teenager. They combine obvious jewelry holders and secret drawers, ink wells and pounce pot for writing with pen tray, pin cushion for pins likely for dressing, and a mirror and toilet bottles like those seen in this Dutch painting. These bottles, square in shape with a pewter screw-on cap and collar glued to the bottle, were some of the least expensive bottles made at the time. An examination of bottles from this period and records from the Vauxhall glass works that dominated that area of the London Thames River show that these bottles were made by the tens of thousands and exported too. When looking at the portion of the box where the bottles sat, you realize that the internal dimensions were set by these bottles and thus not a surprise that the vast majority of them fall into just two sizes, about two inches square and one and a quarter inch square. These bottles existed before the box was made and bought as a standard product that they could get to build the box around. While looking at these bottles deep in the caskets, you might be tempted to think that they are perfectly formed pairs, but closer examination shows that they are extremely cheaply made items. The bottles lean, are misshapen, have many bubble inclusions. Examining the screw tops show us that they are there to hide a broken neck and sometimes it even carelessly protrudes from the collar made without the rolled lip at the top that even ubiquitous wine bottles had at the time. The caps don't rest nicely on the shoulder of the glass because the blowing didn't create an even top in the first place. They are often not the same height, and in so many cases you will find that the cap is tilted or the neck is even off-center. These were used to contain such things as rose or orange water as noted by a pair in Minneapolis that have their original notations written on the cap and many have residue left inside. Compared to other bottles of their day, they are like a Coke bottle, inexpensive and almost disposable if it weren't for the cap. This isn't surprising when you realize that the majority of the box is made of thin pine wood held together only by a little glue and the structural support of the paper wrapped around the sides. Only the exterior of the box uses nails, and none of it uses common joints used in furniture making. These were cheap boxes in their day for little girls, not worthy of the time and expense of the embroidery put on them. Of course, this fact makes reproducing them harder as modern women have a fantasy about what old things may have looked like. Really, valuable equals perfect. A few bottles I have seen had more elaborate pewter tops, but even they distracted from the tilted, off-center, and broken necks of their base glass. The caps were pewter turned on a lathe and the turned collar was glued to the glass, often with an excess room between the cap and the neck being packed with paper. As of yet, I haven't been able to distinguish which of the leading glue candidates was used, hide glue or wax. The prospect of reproducing these bottles was extremely daunting. Metalworking, glass making, and making them stick together, and they would have to fit in a tight space in the casket. Back in 2012, I started the hard work on these bottles, first convincing a dear friend who owned one to allow me to fly to her state and borrow it, hand carrying this 400 year old irreplaceable artifact to Boston and then return it a few weeks later. What I was attempting to do was to make digital files called CAD files of the three pieces, which would allow me to work with manufacturers and artisans without having the original in hand. A former colleague of mine had started a scientific laser scanning company one that focused on small objects and their details versus the ones used to scan the pyramids or to scan Notre Dame only a short time before it burned, fortunately immortalizing its lost details. We started with experiments to figure out how to scan glass bottles. A, gla a laser would normally pass through the glass and not reflect off of it and back to the sensor telling the sensor how far away the surface was. So we started with a small cheap bottle to make sure that the talc we wanted to use as a reflector could easily be removed without water and leave no trace on the historic piece. Yes. Then we coated a larger bottle with a screw-on cap with talc and used that as our first model to scan and see if we could disassociate the cap from the bottle in the CAD files, as the historic bottle still had its screw collar glued on and we weren't going to mess with that, of course. 
Finally, we were ready to scan our historic bottle. There were many scans we needed, with the cap on, off, all sides, the top, the bottom, and some of the items separately. Each time we collected a data file called a point cloud, seen visualized here, with each point representing the measurement of a reflection of the laser off the bottle and the distance to the sensor. We could see that the neck of the original bottle was off-center, and we decided to work with the point cloud to slide and perfect the file of the bottle so I would have the best initial shape to start with as we went towards the idea of mold making. The cap was difficult as we needed many views of it as well as the inside. Of course, the laser can't scan areas that are pointing away from it, and so those areas are dark and have no data. And it wasn't as easy as just making it symmetrical as it is a screw and screws are a spiral. So we needed to use a wax model of the inside to capture the details of the spiral, scan it, and then merge the data. The exterior of the bottle with the glued on screw collar was straightforward, but the interior was harder to capture. We looked at the divot in the bottom, and more importantly, tried to figure out the shape of the neck as it would be so important to the adhesion of the cap collar and the glass. Extra scans of that region were tried to get more data. Finally, we converted everything to a set of CAD files that I could use over the next eight years to try to make these objects. I could use the files on my home 3D printer to print fake bottles and then use an industrial SLA process to make prototypes that showed me if the cap files actually worked and screwed on and off and they fit in the caskets. So the process went in fits and starts over these eight years. Every time I made progress forward, something would send me back to the drawing board. One of the most difficult was getting the caps made. I started with the wonderful people at Danforth Pewter in Vermont who actually can trace their pewter making family lineage back to the revolution. They were the ones who were able to examine the historic bottle before I flew it back to the owner and were able to educate me on the original process used to make the caps using a lathe to turn the pewter. Unfortunately, no one currently lathes, turn, lathes turns pewter this small anymore, and so they wanted to cast the tops. After several back and forths working together, we just couldn't make it work. Casting pewter becomes unreliable when the feature size, such as wall thickness, is less than one millimeter. The caps were thinner than that. And when we resized the caps to allow them to be cast in pewter, they became bulky and the proportion was thrown off from the scale of the bottles. It just didn't look right. So no pewter caps. Years of hand wringing later and 3D printing technologies were improving for metals. I decided to get to try to 3D center an aluminum cap for my files. While it didn't work, a newer mode of 3D printing came along right at the same time, using a wax first and then using that printed wax for the lost wax process used in jewelry making. These caps were beautiful. I could make them in multiple metals from silver to brass and plate them in different finishes. While they were the right size and also screwed well, there were many problems. First, the brass was too bright and yellow compared to our hardware. The silver and rhodinium colors looked wrong against the tin hardware, and most important, the price was just way too high. The caps were more than four or five times the cost of the bottle. The manufacturing company was optimized to make waxes for one-off pieces of jewelry being cast and not to make hun several hundred of the item. In fact, I could only order one at a time. But then I realized that maybe our hardware casting company could take one of these lovely caps and use it as the casting model for their sand casting. And yes, good caps that matched our hardware were to be had. Of course, the pandemic slowed things down for six months, but now I had several hundred screw caps that I was happy with. The bottles have been an equally difficult ride. There are so few historic glass bottle makers and even fewer who were willing to think about the project. In fact, I was turned down, but everyone by two. The reason? clear glass. Today we associate historic glass with being green or cobalt blue because that is what the market for historic reproductions want to buy. It is the elements added to glass furnaces that make them clear, green, or blue, and once those trace elements are in your furnace, that furnace is dirty forever and can only be used for that color. So finding someone who is either willing to buy a new furnace for clear glass or already maintained one for clear melt was an enormous challenge. John Sheldon in Virginia was the first glass blower to really consider the project and taught me quite a bit about how bottles are made, and even went to Williamsburg to see the casket bottles with Kim Ivy. These bottles were made in a rectangular wooden mold that was clasped around the bubble of glass formed at the end of a punt. Further blowing helped the glass to fill the mold. Normally, after the mold is released, a bottle would be rewarmed in the furnace and transferred to a new punt to allow the neck to be shaped and rolled to have a nice neck for a cork but these small toilet bottles have to have a collar put on them, 
so they can't have a rolled neck that uses the pincers to perfect while hot. So the punt is broken off right at that point, often misshaping the neck in the process, and that is the origin of the off-center neck, tilt, or even uneven shoulders on the bottles. While well, John needed to have a new furnace to work on the project, and that ended up being a sticking point, I am indebted to him for considering the project and educating me, and his cobalt bottles are amazing. That knowledge led me to Phil Gilson, another well-known historic glass interpreter. Phil did have a clear glass melt and was interested in the project, and finally, about a year later, he had the time and cool weather to make a mold using my prototype 3D printed bottles. Boxes of small bottles started showing up for me to do quality control on and to figure out the next step, making the neck and the caps work together. It has been several months of work in rejecting bottles, almost 40% are rejected. I had to buy a glass band saw to even out the broken tops after fitting a collar to each to say yes or no and then marking it for glass trimming. Washing the bottles and using solvents to clean the collars for gluing. Fortunately, a common glass glue worked and I didn't have to experiment with paper soaked in hot melted wax, which was the next choice. Hundreds were placed on tables and a matching game was had to find the best closest match to make pairs. They never matched exactly, but they match as well as the historic ones did. They are wonky because they are authentically made without many modern steps. The biggest accommodation to modernity that we made was to omit the original mercury that gave the 17th century bottles a slight brownish tint. But I think we can all agree that turning our beloved glass blower into the Mad Hatter isn't an option today. I hope if you decide to get a set for your casket, the story of how they came to be will be something that you treasure. The search for how to remake them taught me so much about the way that they were made in the past and gave me enormous insights into where the caskets were made as having the bottle supply was an important ingredient. For me, the, it is this in-depth search into the mundane that provides the clues that I am sure will lead me to all the answers I am looking for. The caskets were made in London, I am sure now, with the embroidery sent to be mounted. The glass bottles were likely sourced from one of the many glass blowing workshops in Box Hall where the mirrors were also made. The box makers used the bottles as an internal sizing unit. And at this point, all the finishing materials such as the cheap purple paper lining made for wrapping purchases, the inexpensive casket construction, the crudely made hardware, slapped together ink wells cut with tin snips, and the wonky bottles, where likely half the bottles were made, were actually thrown back into the kiln, all point to the inescapable set of conclusions. These were inexpensive objects made to mount a schoolgirl's work. They weren't carefully crafted artisan objects, but more of a commodity to furnish the corner of a middle-class girl's space. The daughter of a merchant or an artisan shop owner she was. They contained all she needed, her toiletries, her writing supplies, small amounts of jewelry, maybe some needlework, and definitely the little toys and objects that a preteen is drawn to. Tiny objects filled with mystery she loves on her journey to play act towards womanhood. Her dolls were stitched to the outside in storylines that told of piety or female empowerment, allegories for a good life. Here you see the bottles in my two finished caskets, the Harmony with Nature casket and the Five Senses double casket in all its glories with its inkwells as well. I can't tell you how exciting it's been in the last few days to put them inside. It's finished. I started in the year 2000 writing a post-it note on a board of life goals that said, make a casket. I have reached that goal 20 years later by the addition of these little crooked bottles in their tailor-made spot. The journey is now complete. Thank you to those of you who have come on this ride with me. It made it all possible.